Welcome to the Ministry of God's Word presented by Thamu Naidu. Thamu is the apostolic and founding elder of Gate Ministry Santon, located in Gauteng, South Africa. Blessed with worldwide travel and teaching, his mandate is to communicate the ancient biblical blueprint for the accurate building of the Church of God. I'm doing the series on righteousness with you. And uh, I want to talk about the practical side of it today. Um, you know, I've been in a definition mode and, uh, and, and trying to lay the foundations to, to the doctrinal and theological foundations to this very loaded subject called right, righteousness, which, which in theological circles can also be called the doctrine of justification. Um, but I want to start to crawl into the practical side of, the, uh, of our discussion. Uh, there is a positional and functional side to the definition of righteousness. The positional side is that if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then legally, positionally, you become an official member of the family of God, a constituted member of the family of God, which literally means that your name is written in the book of life and that God knows you by name, and uh, you're automatically received as if you are his only child, his son, and uh, that makes you righteous. But functionally, righteousness demands that we start to live as the children of God that expresses in a very explicit way um, the stature uh, and the dignity of the family that we belong to. So if I am positionally and legally a member of the family of the creator of the heavens and the earth, and that creator is my father, and I'm his child, his son, I'm expected then to live by a standard, a norm, uh, that, uh, that justifies my position in the family. And you know, any good family understands these principles, any good family. Uh, that that our children who live in our homes must be a good example of the family we live in. And that would be called, in, in legal doctrinal terms, the doctrine of sanctification, the doctrine. It's got to do with our functional and very practical side of living out what our position is, our legal position is in God. Um, but for want of a better description, uh, or definition of the, the term righteousness or the word righteousness, I tell you that righteousness is a pre-existent design that God had established long before he created the human race. And that design determined how we would, func how we would be positioned in relationship to him and how we would function over everything he created. So that design which is the standard and the measure by which we should exist, is called righteousness. Righteousness is an eternal principle that was resident in God's mind before he created the human race. The human race, in its original design, was not intended to be created to be creatures of creation. They were, they were created to function as God's sons, as God's family, over his estate, the whole of creation. And uh, in the whole principle of that design, God, ex God predetermined that his image and his likeness would be represented. So in each one of us uh, is supposed to be represented God's, the very essence of everything God is. The invisible God would become visible in us. So, so legally and functionally, God designed how we should exist. Uh, first, as his children, which we call sons of God, and secondly, over his estate, which is our function, uh, and, and that function demands a certain way of living, a certain way of living. When we fulfill that, that very complex design, God then deems us to be righteous. God deems us to be righteous, and he expects us to live by righteous standards in the earth. Um, and so this word, righteous, um, 
is a very powerful word. It's a legal word. It's a, it can become a domestic word, a practical word, and a word that, that needs to become the measure by which we choose to exist in the earth. And so I've been laboring the point with you over and over again in the last few weeks because righteousness is going to become the measure by which God judges the earth. Uh, the Bible says that he will convict the earth uh, of righteousness in the last days. And the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a convictor of righteousness. So, excuse me, uh, that is a fundamental. The earth is about to be judged. Uh, this week, I met with somebody who, you know, who is a leader in the global community, and he made a statement, and he said to me, Thamo, we are so close to the finish. And what God is looking for in the earth presently is righteousness. Righteousness will exalt the people of the Lord and bring great judgment upon the earth. If we do not comply to a righteous standard, then we will be judged no different to every other person that is not in compliance with that standard. So God is going to judge the earth. And great, great judgment is coming to the earth. I am not surprised at some of the leaders that God has placed over nations, like in the north of our world, North America. I think God is appointing certain people just to bring about the final demise of all the systems of the earth. God sometimes will put foolish and mad people to rule over the earth to finally destroy what man has created. This is the God we serve. God can, God can do things. He can permit things. He, he showed that to us um, in the superpower called Babylon where he had a man called Nebuchadnezzar, placed him over the earth. The man ruled as if he was God himself. And then God removed his, his hand from this man and the man became demented and, and he was reduced. He, he, he devolved to a position of becoming no different to an animal. He lost his sanity, he, um, and he lived like the beast of the field for, for, for at least 15 years before God then restored him to his, to his kingdom. And God, God, God can do this, and God is doing some, some extremely, uh, he's permitting some extremely extraordinary things to take place in the earth as systems and Governments in the earth are experiencing confusion, corruption, and are failing. And in the midst of all of that, God is expecting for you and me, his church, to come up to the standards that he has designed us to function by. When we live by those standards, I can tell you, then you're going to see the mighty hand of God operate in the earth. So we're living in very, very significant times significant times, and I cannot emphasize how dark this world is and how important it is for us to be God's light, and that light is expressed through a righteous standard in the earth. So it is in that context, um, the Bible tells us um, in Romans chapter 3, verse 21, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed being witnessed, Romans 3.21, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. In Romans 5, verse 6, I just want to read the scriptures into the scripture, and I want to get to some very practical things today. For when we were still without strength, Romans 5, 6, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. And then if you went to 17, for if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and, and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one. Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, which is humanity, 
resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. So if you've received the free gift, you've not only received the gift of salvation, but you've received uh, the gift of righteousness. You are now compliant to a heavenly design. Moreover, the law entered that offense um, might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that sin reigned in death. Even so, grace might reign through what? Through righteousness. So if you want the grace of God to operate in your lives, what do you need? To come to a compliance standard called righteousness. Firstly, in your legal understanding of your position in God, which is that you're a son of God, male and female. And secondly, that now I must live by divine standards in this world. I can't choose to live freely, licentiously, hedonistically, carnally, and then say, oh, the grace of God will cover my sins because he understands. So a lot of people doing this, and they don't understand that righteousness rules true grace. Um, and that's what the Bible tells us uh, here yeah, so clearly. And then it goes a little further and says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, and the word sinner here means disconnected from God. Don't think about smoking and drinking now, because that's how people think about sin. Okay? Sin means to lose, to miss the point, to disconnect, to wander away from the original intent. That's the first meaning of sin. And the moral meanings and the ethical re me meanings can become all the other stuff. Okay, all the stuff that corrupts the body. All right, but fundamentally and principally, we all were disconnected from God by one man. Uh, so also by one man's obedience, by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous, brought back to compliancy. Say to your neighbor, compliancy. Okay, so we now become compatible with the original intent. Moreover, the law entered that, of, that the offenses might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's a very important thing. If you went to Romans 8 verse, uh, uh, verse 4, I can't read all the scriptures, so I'm just jumping here that the righteous requirement of the law. Let me read from verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, disconnection. Your lights were off. You lost your oxygen. You were taken off life, divine life support. The, the air that, that God breathed in you was gone. That's what sin means here. You now lived just chronologically. You just lived for the, for the time your body clock can, can keep you functioning. Now, it is in that context God sent his son, sent his son uh, uh, in the likeness of, uh, uh, of sin, on the count of, uh, in the likeness of, of sinful flesh, on the count of sin, he condemned sin, the disconnection. In other words, he reconnected you in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, which I'm going to talk to you about today. Now, how we are going to live our lives? By being connected, plugged in to the spirit. All right? We now got reconnected. Just think, your lights got disconnected. Um, uh, we are moving house shortly, and we made a mistake and gave telecom um, the wrong date of the termination of our home line. And, uh, and when our home line got terminated one month before we could move house, uh, I was trying to get onto the internet for a couple of days, and I just thought, wow, what's happening? We just simply, all the lights were on, saying you connected, but we were disconnected. Until we phoned Telcom and discovered we were disconnected, disconnected, because we terminated our services in that house. And sometimes you are disconnected. You terminated your services. And Jesus came to reconnect you. 
so that you have a line to heaven. You have a lifeline. You have an oxygen flow. You have ruach that now comes back. So no more you operate just by breathing. Now you operate by the ruach of God, the pneuma of God. The Spirit of God is now in you. you and, and this Spirit now is going to, He's going to be the voice. He's going to be, as I told you last week, He's going to become your counselor, your legal advisor. He's going to be your teacher, your mentor. He's going to be there to, to nag you and, and, and to and conscientize you when you miss it. And, and if you really keep Him connected, let me tell you something, your mind will be awake to the things of God, then the mind of God is in you and not the mind of flesh. Some people have had their nerve endings disconnected. So they don't even know that they have a seared conscience. It's burnt. So they can sin, they can lie, they can cheat, they can do this stuff, they can come to church, they can lift their hands, they can sing, they can say great sermon, they can even say amen to the point that they are contradicting, and go home and not even see the error of their ways because the Holy Spirit is not there in them. Uh, religion is in them, but not the Holy Spirit. So we're not walking according to our humanity or according to how we function as mere earthlings. That's what flesh means. When you see the word flesh, flesh in this context, sarks, it basically means a body absent of the breath of God, the Spirit of God. So you just live. You live healthy, maybe, fit, maybe sharp, intelligent, but dead. Dead. Because God's life is not in you. But when the Holy Spirit is in you, you start to live according to the Spirit, and He worries you. He worries you. I mean, just, you know, it's amazing how you feel so, so perplexed, so embarrassed, so ashamed of yourself when you just make a blunder. Just lose it for a moment, and then you feel so sick with yourself. What actually happened? It's not just your conscience telling you you messed up. It's the Holy, Holy Spirit animating your conscience to educate you that you've just slipped up there. And then you adjust that position, and then you feel a little bit better. It's like the Holy Spirit reassuring you that He is still with you. Are you with me? You're very quiet today. I don't know if it's my blocked ears or you are quiet. Pinch your neighbor and say, wake up. Okay, so it's in that context. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, for to be carnally minded, to think like a mere earthling, a human being, is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God, cannot, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. For if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So, so how does God identify who is really his? By the Spirit. That's the, you know, God is Spirit. So the, the atomic nature, the nuclear structure, the very essence, the DNA of God is Spirit. And so how does God identify whether you're of him? If you live by that breath, by, that, by the spirit that, that animates and en enables and energizes you. So if anyone does not have the spirit, he's not of his. But if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit of, is life because of? Talk to me. Come on. Talk to me. Because of? Righteousness. Because when the spirit is in you, he's going to first tell you who your daddy is, who you are. God is your father, you are his son, 
He's going to tell you how to live in this world. He's going to order your steps and direct your path. He's going to conscientize you, and he's going to nag you, and he's going to irritate you, and he's going to make you feel uncomfortable when you do things that are not compliant with what you... He's going to cause red flags to come up in your spirit and sirens to blast. And what's he actually doing? He's telling you, come on, man, Thamo, you're messing it up. Come on, you're messing it up. And then you immediately adjust. And what's happening to your life? You're actually now living compliant to pre-existent design, eternal standards, which is in accordance with the position that God wanted you to function in. After all, we are carrying his presence. We have not, our bodies are not our own. It is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we are the dwelling place of God. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. You know, these scriptures are so simple yet so difficult to interpret. So God is calling us to live a life of the spirit. And this is where the practical side, I'm laying the foundation to that practical side. Hebrews chapter 5, let's read this quickly. All these scriptures, I'm going to really go and unpack it later on in the series. Okay, but yeah, I'm just laying the basis. Verse 5. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was said, but it was he who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. So in a son, God appoints a son to priesthood to high priesthood. And he also says in another place, you're the priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And who's Melchizedek? Melchi. What does Melchi, Melchi mean? King. Okay? Melchi, king. One who is appointed as king. And Zedek is the Hebrew word for righteous. My king is righteous. So what is the arrangement for our lives? God appointed us to this high and position of royalty and dignity, of kingship, of ruling. And how do we rule? We rule as people of righteousness, which is the original design for our lives. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up praise and supplication, would vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, Yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And please, the word suffered is not a nice word. It's a King James language word. You know, the, the best word here is experienced. Experienced. By the things he experienced. And not everything we experience causes suffering. Okay? It's just encounters in life. Encounters in life. By the things which he encountered, which include sometimes some pain, some hardship, some trials, some testings. Having been perfected through the things he went through in life, the practicality of life, the everyday issues of life. Like you jump into a car and you may have a squabble in the car about whether you want to eat Nando's or a burger from McDonald's. Okay, you may have a squabble over that, but that could teach you also some aspect of how to deal with a crisis or to deal with an experience and an encounter, etc. So what am I saying? Every encounter in life, every practical issue in life, you must convert it into an opportunity to learn how to submit to a higher order. What is the word obedience? The word obedience, the root meaning of the word obedience. The word obedience and the word hearing comes from the same root. Okay, so to obey means to submit, to submit to a higher voice, okay, to come under another instruction. So when we say to obey, we talk about a, a kind of a subordinate position. And this is, this is the area where a lot of people are insubordinate. They don't want to submit, to come under, to learn how to obey. And we don't obey without bringing ourselves under the voice of the one who instructs us. And the Holy Spirit, in our daily living, will teach you these aspects, these aspects of obedience. He became the author, and having been perfected, matured. Say to your neighbor, mature. Perfect means to be mature. Okay, it does not mean sinless, blemishless. 
it does not mean that you are now the perfect article. Some people think that of themselves, but let me tell you, none of us are perfect in that context. Okay, it's not deficient free. It means mature. Mature to assess, to evaluate, to measure, to discern, to dissect, to choose right from wrong, to make prudent and expedient decisions. All of those things have got to do with maturity. Handling a crisis situation, learning how to deal with turmoil and so forth. That's what maturity is. And having been perfected, matured in that way, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey, called by God as high priest according to the arrangement of the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain because you have become dull of hearing. The word hearing here has got to do with the whole idea of obedience. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need somebody to teach you, again, the first principles of the oracles of God, the fundamentals of God, and you have, have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is what? Unskilled in what? The word of righteousness. And what is the word of righteousness? The word of righteousness will teach you obedience how to submit to obedience. So if you want to be part of a Melchizedek order, and I really want to talk about Melchizedek, this mystery man, maybe next year in January when you get back. I really want to talk because that's the arrangement God is going to have for us. We are going to become kings after the order of Melchizedek, this mystery man, this endless genealogy. We're going to step into an eternal position from which we can govern. This is the template, okay? And this is the order we're going to come into as a corporate people. But to get there, you, if you want to become good at obedience, you have to become skilled in the word that will instruct you in righteousness. Okay, and the ultimate is not so much, oh, I look right. That's not it. That's a pietistic position. Uh, the ultimate is that if I can submit to an eternal standard, then I am actually submitting to a culture of righteousness a culture of compliance and com compatibility to the eternal design of God. So that's what I'm talking about. So it's in that context, uh, uh, he's unskilled in the word of righteousness, uh, of righteousness and he becomes a baby, immature, uh, you know, still in a kind of a developmental stage of growth. And we can't be there forever. You know, young people, we have a lot of young people in this church, Learn from people like us, old people, okay? Uh, and learn one thing. Some of us old people never learned anything of note for the years we've been in the church because religion was stuffed down our throats without teaching us the aspects that can, can grow us up. And many of us are only growing in recent years the way we should be growing. You don't have to be there. When you come to our age, um, you should come to a place where you're no more a baby. Okay, and I was saying this to somebody the other day. I said, you can be 80 years old and still have that little baby behavior in you. And there's a lot of people that grew up chronologically, but in terms of spiritual maturity, they've not matured. They've actually put their spiritual growth on pause. Okay, and maybe we have to reactivate the pause button so that we can grow up into Christ. And so in this house, we need to produce a bunch of people that are so skilled in the word of righteousness. And the skill, and understand the word skill here. It's a technical word. It's a, it's, it's a word that's got to do with somebody who has, who has developed a mastery in a field of discipline. Like a surgeon with a scalpel, like a technician, um, in his field of discipline. Uh, recently, I'm watching carpenters and builders and, and others work, and I'm beginning to realize that you need a skill for these things. And I'm realizing that uh, in, uh, in the church today, we need to build these architectural and technical skills that will produce a bunch of people that are so good at it that the moment they face uh, a, a situation in their lives, in their daily living, they, they are so good at it 
that they can immediately address that. They calm, they collected, uh, they confident. Uh, everybody around them is anxious, like somebody. I mean, look at a doctor in a trauma ward. Everyone else is, is, is you know, frantic and 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 caught up with the emotions. And a doctor seems to be totally disconnected from that emotional context, and he, and he or she works so clinically with the patient under great duress because of the skills they've developed. And I'm talking about a practical side to our lives. No matter what you are faced with, whatever the quandaries that you, know, you will be challenged with in life, whatever you go through, you have developed the skill, the technical skill, of handling the word of righteousness that when people look at you, they don't say, you're a fledgling, you're an intern, you just, you, you're an apprentice. They look at you and they say, you're a master in your field because you have developed the skill of a listening ear. You are so good at knowing how to take God's word. Are you understanding? This is the order of Melchizedek. The Bible says here, for who, for, uh, 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 but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses to exercise to discern good and evil. And you become so good at what you do. And I told you last week about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit and righteousness. But Galatians chapter 5, I want to go to it. Uh, uh, last week I read for you John chapter 16. Now, the first thing you have to do about righteousness, I told you, is you have to become skilled in the Word of God so that you can live this out practically. The second thing that you have to understand about righteousness is that you can't be skilled in the Word of God if you do not know the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is very important here, and we emphasize that Galatians 5, 5 says, For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. The Holy Spirit will bring to you. You have to talk to him. You have to talk to the Holy Spirit. You know, I'm having conversations with the Holy Spirit like, there's so many blind spots in my life. Can you help me see it so that I can bring the word of righteousness into that area? Can you convict me of areas of unrighteous behavior and show me the righteous word that will instruct me to live better in that area? Can you talk to the Holy Spirit like that? Don't only say to the Holy Spirit, more power. More power. More anointing. Come on, say to him, speak to me. To educate me. Open my, my mind to me. Show me the areas that are blind spots and dark areas. Show me those areas that have become castles that, you know, entrenched with fortresses. And I need to bring those walls down. All of that. Uh, and the Holy Spirit will do that. The Holy Spirit will do that. Now, now to get into the whole dimension of righteousness, obviously living under the, the, the leadership of the Holy Spirit will expose the Word of God. Um, we need to come to a place of understanding that those who live or desire to live righteously must live by faith, by faith, okay? You can't become righteous by just simply saying, oh, I do the things that are right. And I've already debunked that whole position that righteousness is right living. Righteousness is not right living. It's not rectitude. It's not a moral and ethical code that you've standardized as the norm by which you live. Righteousness is the design that God has designed. Don't play with that design. Don't tell me God understands he'll wink at your sins. Okay? There's a standard. Now, so, but for you to live by the standards of righteousness, you have to have faith. And if there's, if there's anything I can bring into our complex brains, is one simple discipline, and that is to believe God. Just believe. Contrary to facts. Contrary to environmental conditions, contrary to the accumulation of data that you may have gathered that suggests otherwise. I'm not asking you to be foolish, but I'm asking you to believe. Simple. Simple. Believe despite how intelligent you are. Believe 
even though the sums don't add up. Believe even when it, it doesn't seem possible. Believe when everyone tells you you're mad. Okay? Uh, believe. And you're not believing in yourself. And you're not believing in positive thoughts. You're believing in a word that has been certified and proven to be the canon, the absolute standard by which we live. That's the 66 books of the Bible. And this is the word of God. Uh, and this is the standard by which a man who lived out his life lived. And his name is Abraham, and he's our father. Say to your neighbor, Abraham is your papa. <laughs> okay? Uh, brethren, Romans 10. Romans 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for, f f uh, to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Okay, for I bear them witness. And saved here does not mean out of hell into heaven. Saved means uh, that you are now brought back to your original position of functioning as a son to your father. Okay, that you're a member of the family of heaven. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of, talk to me, talk to me, being ignorant of, God's righteousness, that's salvation, okay? The, in the righteous design is the salvation plan. And seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So what do you have to believe? What do you have to believe? You have to believe the word of God. And what does the Word of God say? Number one, that if you have accepted Christ, you are His Son. Can you believe that? If you believe that, you are positionally and legally and judicially certified as righteous, that I am a son of God. You could, you could not identify your parents. Your father may have abandoned you early or he died early. Or you may not be so proud of your upbringing or of the origins, your roots, etc. And sometimes we all have, some of us have positive, you know, pictures of our past, and some of us not so. And those are the realities of life. But one thing you have to know that if you've come into the family of God, if you've come into the family of the God, first thing you must understand which makes you righteous is a simple belief system that says, despite how the world classifies me, categorizes me, or stigmatizes me, it, despite all of that, I know who I am. I believe I'm a child of God. I'm a son of God, male or female. I am a son of God. And because I have accepted Christ, I carry the same seed that was in Christ, in Jesus. And I am a son of God. If you can get that into your brain, into your soul, into your spirit, if you can rewrite even the nuclear structure of your entire being, if you can get that into your being, you're automatically righteous. Okay? But that's a part of your righteousness. Okay? Can you get that into you? Can you believe? Okay? And don't believe that you... You know, some people think, oh, okay, um, if I live a perfect life, I can believe that. No, 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 no. No. Even if you live an imperfect life, if you believe that and you've got no other God, okay, you're not sharing your room with, your devil, with the devil, okay, you have no other idols in your life, you may have some habits, some impediments, some unclean patterns of living. You may have some, some ethical codes that violate things, okay? That's what we call pigsty living, okay? You're a son. In my, you know, the, the boy in the pigsty came to his senses after he squandered his father's inheritance, and he said, in my father's house, in my father's house, even the servants live better. So, with, I mean, living with pigs, living in filth, in squalor, he comes like that to his father, but in his mentality... I'm going to go and tell my father I sinned against heaven, the standard, and against you, the relationship, 
that heaven justifies. Be and because he understood that pigsty and all, non-kosher and all, my father will hug me and kiss me. He wouldn't say first going to have a bath then. He'll kiss him with many kisses on his neck, hug him, then clean him up, then have the party. Okay? So similarly, you need to understand legally and practically through a belief system, I'm a child of God. Okay? Some of you may carry a... I'm trying to find a nice word, you know, sometimes not very good at words. A bad smell. Okay, in the spirit. In the spirit. You've got some things you must clean up. But you, you're not worshipping other gods. You are intact in your belief that Jesus is your Lord. Okay, you've confessed him with your mouth. Your heart believes. You're saved. But you're not living a sanctified life. Now we'll deal with that. Now, if you can only believe that, you are legally righteous. You know, there's a sin unto death, and there's a sin that is not unto death. Some of you will, will experience the effects of sin in your fleshly body because you violated codes, but your spirit will go to heaven. You understand what I'm saying? But you will not have heaven on earth. You'll have a messed up life on it because you made the wrong decisions. But I want to get you to the other part, that you won't only believe that you're a son, but you'll start to live that clean life, not in the pig's parlor. That's where we have to go to. And that's where the practical side of my theology will come to you. For Christ, the Bible says, for Moses writes that the righteousness which is of the law, the man who does them... Uh, who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that's hell, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, and this is in brackets, the word of faith which we preach. So what I am preaching to you, what the apostles, like Paul is preaching to us, is basically how you bring Christ. You're not going to go to heaven to bring him down. You're not going to hell to bring him up. How do you bring him? By receiving the word which we preach, and you receive that word and receive it, believing that immediately sets up salvation for you. And what is salvation? The righteousness of God that's going to come to you. Are you hearing me? Can you get this? Can you get this? Get it into you. Because let me tell you, a lot of people think, you know, the way the commercial gospel is going today, you have to buy God, you have to sow something, you have to, you have to do something, you have to pay your penance, uh, you have to make restitution. And yes, there's a place for some, some of that. But in this context, if you can confess him with your heart, mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you are saved. Ask your neighbor if they believe. Then say to your neighbor, confess what you believe. Then pronounce upon your neighbor, you are saved. Amen? But if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Wow. So easy. You didn't, you didn't go and have a three oil bath. You know what that is in Hinduism, okay? Or you didn't have to, you know, do, make, make a, a pilgrimage to some holy site and pay your dues. All you did was you believed, confessed the Lord Jesus, and it's pronounced upon you, saved. Well, you didn't even get baptized yet, and you saved. Okay, baptism is a wonderful rite that we practice after that. But you're saved. And that, what does that do to you? It makes you righteous. Look, look, look a little further here. Look a little further. For with the heart, one believes unto? Now the heart can't lie. Say to your neighbor, the heart can't lie. <laughs> okay, your thoughts can lie. Your attitudes can lie. Your 
your, conf- your decisions can lie, your, even your confessions can lie. But your heart, and you know, when God looks at a man, he looks at his heart, he reads the heart. God is a reader of hearts, not behavior. Okay? And he reads your heart, and in your heart, I believe, I believe, I believe that Jesus is my Savior. I can read a thousand books that tells me that he's not the Savior. He's just one of another, you know, human that lived the earth. I can read all the contentions and the disputes about his, his incarnation, whether he was really God or not, whether his parents really had him. Was he a phantom? No, no, no. I believe that he is Lord. And I confess it with my mouth. Righteousness is established. Established. Okay, so how do you get righteousness? Say with your heart believing. Say to your neighbor, righteousness comes... When you believe with your heart, not just with your, just, not just with, you know, empty thoughts. It's, it's, I'm talking about a conviction that emanates from deep within. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him shall not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And how can they call on him in whom they have not believed? And you believe with the heart, okay? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So people like me are important to you. Especially if it's a karuks, one who's, who's been, whose feet has been washed by the Lord to carry his body to you. Okay? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? And it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things, and they, and they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said... Who has believed our report? So then, so then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So how do you get into your practical way of living? You have to believe. You have to believe in those who are sent to you. You have to believe in the word they bring to you. And as you generate the faith in your life, you are going to become rich in the things of God. The ones that that try to be clever. I use the word consciously, clever, actually silly. Don't get clever with these things. Believe. Believe, especially those who bring Christ to you and don't bring themselves to you. Not every preacher that preaches is of Christ. Are you with me? So our father Abraham believed Look at Genesis 15, verses 1 to 16. He believed and God reckoned him righteous. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. This is not Abraham. He didn't didn't have the circumcision yet. Um, He didn't go through the regeneration process that would be sealed with with the covenant. And Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? And the hair of my house is Eliza of Damascus. And Abraham said, then Abraham said, look, you have given me no children, no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house, a servant is the hair. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your hair, but one who will come from your own body shall be your hair. Now, this guy is over 75 years old. I mean, that alone makes it almost impossible. Okay? Um, Then he brought him outside and said, Look now towards heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. So here's a guy, 75 years old, looking in the sky. No glasses. Those days they had no glasses. Probably had decent sight, I hope. Trying to count the stars. And probably looking at some galaxies, looking at the Milky Way. And God is saying to the 75-year-old, 
They're going to have children. And he's probably counting stars and looking at that dead woman. He's called Sarah. Sarai at that point in time. And saying, God, that one? That one? I mean, the facts are not counting in favor of your word. The facts are not counting. And you know all the logics here now, all the rational thinking, the reasoning that goes with this. Look now towards heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be, so shall your children be. Here's a guy talking about childless, barrenness. And you know what verse 6 says? And he believed, not in the word, but he believed in the Lord that gave the word. You listen, listen, you know, I hold on to prophecy. Outside, I mean, for me, this is the most important prophecy. I'm not interested in all the other prophecies. And I have quite a few of them, amazing prophecies in my life. And they're great prophecies. But I hold on to this because this is a more sure word of prophecy. If there's anything in that book, no matter how clever I think I may be, I'm not going to challenge it. I'm going to take it at what it says. Then secondly, I believe in the gift of prophecy that this Bible speaks about. It says, covet the best gifts. Okay? And if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you'll get a prophet's reward. And there are certain people I know, they come to me as the Lord, the prophet. And there's the five dimensions of Christ that comes in different human vessels, and one is the prophet. And so because my Bible tells me I must believe in, yes, not just the word, but the prophets that bring the word, and that I must not neglect the gift of prophecy that was given to me, and some of it was given to me in the youth of our ministry. I hold on to it. But I don't hold on to it because of the prophecy. I hold on to it because I believe the Lord of that word. My trust is not in that word. It's in the Lord and then secondly in the word. Are you understand? Do you understand? Not in the prophet, even though I receive him as if I'm receiving the Lord. But, and when I believe it, what's it reckoned? The Bible says, God reckoned him righteous. God did the sums and said righteous. Now, how many of you can just, just literally, just shut down all these complicated ways of living? Start to hold on to him that he will not leave you nor forsake you. Even if you go through a tough time in life, you'll trust him. He won't abandon you. Sometimes you'll feel like you're in hell and he abandoned you. But even there you believe. Though I am in Sheol, you will be with me. Though when everything around me fails, you will be with me. I'm your son. You're a good father. Even though you may leave me to die on the cross, not my will but yours be done. And I'm naked and everyone's spitting and mocking me and taunting me. But I still believe that if I die, I can take my life up again. That's the extremity of my belief. I believe. If you believe like that in your daily living, I am not asking you to do this on a Sunday. On your daily living, I believe. What happens to you? God looks at you and he says, righteous. I mean, Abraham, for 24 years, 75, when he was asked to leave heir of the Chaldees, a very thriving community. They say that region was probably the metropolis, the center of uh, civilization at that point in time. Hive of, of economic activity. One of the greatest traders from there went into the world uh, to transact and to conquer the territories around them. And here's Abraham leaving all of that when God came to him with a word in Genesis chapter 12 and said to him, I'm going to bless you. Make you a father of nations. And he takes that word, he goes, and then a few years later, 
is having this conversation with God in chapter 15, but I'm still childless. She's still barren. I have to give the, the, everything I have. You've made me rich, even though I left everything. To give it to Elisa is like a son to me, adopted. Yes, I'll give it to him, but he's not from my body. It's not a hair. And God says, don't bother. Count the stars. It's going to bless you. And then he has to still, maybe 17 years later, wait. No prophecy fulfilled. And then when he is 99 and she is 89, gets another visit. I mean, this is a long time later. Uh, she's 89. And she, when she hears the news, she doesn't know whether she's excited or she's mocking. She's laughing. And at the age of 90, she's pregnant. She's giving birth to a, to a son, Isaac. They call him laughter because he will, he will fill the earth with joyous laughter. She gives birth to the son. He's 100 years old. Her 25 years he had to wait for the prophecy to be fulfilled, and he believed. This is practical living. I'll talk about employment. I'll talk about... And they talk about marriage, and they talk about a lot, lot of other stuff where we have to get all the dots in place. But the first thing, the theology is you have to believe. And some of you don't believe. You only believe after your salary is exhausted. Okay? You only believe because you have a job. You only believe because of this and that. We first secure our own our own things, and then we want to believe. But he believed in the absence of evidence. And that's what I'm asking you to do here today. You know, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 5, Therefore he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles amongst you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Okay, let, let, let me explain this. Look at the scripture. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles amongst you. Let's say it's the Lord Jesus. Okay, who gave you the Spirit, he's, who baptized you in the Holy Spirit, who provides the miracles for you to his finished work. Oh, Father in heaven. The both of them are together. Okay. Does he do it in your lives? Because you do, oh, you come to church every Sunday, you pay your tithes. You don't do all the other things that the other person in the church does. You know the people in the church that do all that stuff. The ones that you compare yourself with. Do you think God looks at all of that and says, okay, now I'll give you a miracle because you wasn't in the disco last night. <laughs> no. God does not measure you by the standard a code of conduct that you've established. God measures you in terms of how he will provide for you by your belief. That's what the Bible says here. Not by the works of law as in the legal standards and ceremonial standards that codify your behavior, but by belief. And where does belief come? In the heart, and the heart can't lie. Okay, now look at the next verse. Oh, by the hearing of faith, just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted for him, to him for righteousness. Obviously, there's an action in this word which literally implies that, um, that to believe God, he had to leave his father's house, he had to leave his country, he had to disconnect from a whole lot of stuff. And you know, I mean, I, I, this house has been built on faith. We left everything, to come and plant this church. That's a belief, okay? And that belief classifies this house as a righteous house. We may, be, we may not all be compliant to certain standards or perfect in certain ways, but belief justifies the establishment of this work as righteous. This wasn't started through a church split or through some conniving. We just had to come with raw faith, take a decision, leave everything we had, book a hotel, 
just hope that we heard right. Doubted many times in that period, like Abraham. But in your heart of hearts, you just did it because you believed. Are you hearing me? That kind of nature we have to inculcate in this house. Let's read the, the rest of this. I'm going to go a little beyond my time. It's still too early in any case for you to go home. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are of faith are the sons of Abraham. Okay, where am I now? Okay, so Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore know that only those who of faith are, 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 faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture forcing that God would justify the Gentiles, Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham before, uh, beforehand saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are, faith, are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. And this guy, let me tell you, because of his faith, he accredited to his, I mean, he accumulated to his account such a credit balance that if for an eternity of eternities, it will never be depleted. And anyone who believes shares in the same eternal privilege of promise. You can never deplete your account. You know, all our accounts sometimes get empty. Um, we sometimes end up in an overdraft or, or into a credit line. And it happens. But if you believe, you're accumulating to yourself an account. That's just amazing. And that's all I'm asking us to do here. Just believe. Just believe. Believe in who you are. Believe in the promises that God has given to Abraham. Believe. Romans 4 says this. Verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So God didn't... I mean, Abraham didn't get this belief, this, this, this thing accredited to his account because he left, heir of the Chaldees, left his father's house, decided to live in a tent, gave up his trading, very flourishing enterprise. He was a merchant, the equivalent of trading on the stock market today. That's what he was. They said he would have been, in the equivalent of today's language, one of the billionaires of the earth. He gave up all that. He just believed. But God didn't measure it by his works. God measured it by the disposition of his heart and the confession that came with it. Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his, his faith is accounted for Righteousness, just as David also described the blessedness of the man whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. So what's the whole deal here? Don't try to create an impressionable culture of works. Listen, there's a practical side, I'll talk about it. But even the practical side will not justify why God is going to bless you. God is going to bless you because you simply believe, not because of what you did. Not what you did. That's where righteousness starts. Not what I do, but what I believe he promised me. And if I do it, God then sends into your account not money, because he didn't create it. But he sends grace that can give you money and prosperity and favor and long life and well-being, all those things get transferred into an account and it's called grace. And when he makes all grace abound to you, he then gives you seed for the sower and bread for the eater. He gives you all the things that you need in life. So when you want to build this account, you build it through belief. And belief increases the measures of grace in your life. And when grace is added, 
David calls that righteousness. Righteousness. That's the standard, that substance by which you live. It comes and fills your body. Allows you to do things. And then, and you know, one of, the, the grace has so many acronyms to it. So many words. And one of it is favor. Uh, the other is charm. The other is elegance. And the other is prosperity. But just think about favor. The, the word for, um, out of the word favor comes the word favorite. So just imagine if you got grace, then you're working in a place. And yes, hostile environment, and suddenly you stand head over others. Head and shoulders above others. Okay? Short as you are, like. Okay? You stand above. What happened? The grace generates a coat of many colors in the spirit. It attracts favor. And people say, you are the favorite. And you didn't curry favor. Okay, you didn't bribe to get it. You didn't buy it. You didn't sell your soul. But because you believed, because you believed, all these things happened to you. And there's an elegance that comes into your life. There's a charm. People are attracted to you. Doors automatically open. You set yourself, your, your feet in a certain area, and things turn around. I mean, I think about Isaac a little later on, when, when there's a terrible famine, a drought in the land, and it comes with a recession. I mean, think about Cape Town today, where the dams are totally dry, where people are now drilling for water just to get supply in certain places. And you drill in a certain spot, and you can't strike water. Okay, but when Isaac drills on the same spot, he hits water. Then you know favor is with you. Okay, when people take your water, your wells, and then you go and dig in places they've been looking for water and they can't find it. But when you go there, you find it. What happens? I mean, the past the water, the aqua systems, the subterrestrial, uh, you know, aqua systems suddenly redirect their paths to you because of the favor of God. Where did it all start? Belief in the heart, transfer of grace into the account, heaven says righteous, and God can never withhold bread from the righteous. Can never. How many of you want this? How many of you want this? And it does not come by works, but it comes through, and I'll close with this. For the promise, verse 13, that he would be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are his, faith is void and the promise made of no effect because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. So the promise does not come through legal living. And I'm not in any way suggesting you can go and live like the devil and his angels. I'm not in any way suggesting that because this message is not complete. But it comes by just, I'm getting the position right. Favor. And let me tell you, if God's going to judge the world and systems are going to implode, how are the righteous going to stand? Because God establishes us in righteousness. I think Isaiah 54 says that. God establishes us in righteousness. How are you going to stand when unemployment is taking place, retrenchments, downsizing, um, and so forth? It's not going to happen by conniving. And so you can go that route, and maybe you'll keep your job. But you'll become a slave to the one who owns you. Or you can put your trust in God can believe in him and favor will create an environment for you to become valuable and blessed within the economy of God. Are you understanding me today? So I want you to stand with me.